Keeping your automated acceptance test running when your system is under development is hard. Separation of concerns can help. Let's find out how. In this episode, I'm going to describe how to write acceptance tests uh, that don't break as your system changes. I'm going to describe my preferred four-layer approach to organising the test cases that we write and the infrastructure that supports them. Keep a lookout for uh, my free guide to acceptance testing described later in the video. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe and if you think it appropriate, like the video. Acceptance tests are always written from the perspective of an external user of the system. We're trying to separate how the system works from what we would like it to do. Our focus is on the what in this, in this kind of testing. In Brian Marrick's excellent model, uh, th these are tests that are business facing and support programming. So these are the t th this is the focus for, our, for, for this episode. When written before the code and uses executable specifications, they're a fantastic tool to drive development. So we want to evaluate our system in lifelike scenarios from the perspective of an external user of the system, executed in production-like test environments. Uh, this sounds great, but people have been trying to do this for years, except for the executable specification bit, perhaps. But on the whole, they've done this with poor results. So how can we do better? How can we solve the problem of these big, more complicated tests? These tests are genuinely complex. We're trying to start up a whole system in a lifelike uh, test environment. And so these tests can be very fragile if not written well. When the system changes, the problem is, is that they nearly always cause the test to fail. That's kind of inevitable at one level. If the tests are asserting behavior and the behavior of the system changes, Fair enough, but even small changes can often cause breakages. So we need to think about ways in which we can tackle the fragility of these more complicated tests. I spoke about a key idea in this separation in an earlier video, which you can see here. Separating what the system should do from how it does it. But how do we achieve that? Let's walk through a simple example and look at this in a bit more detail than we did last time. Imagine that our job is to test buying a book from Amazon. That's our use case. That's what we're going to explore today. The first thing that we would like to do is we'd probably like a requirement that captures that use case. So here's our requirement. We'd like to be able to pay for books with a credit card. So that's our starting point. Now let's imagine how we're going to take that requirement, that user story, and turn that into an executable specification and acceptance test that evaluates what we'd like the system to do. So let's imagine somebody doing that. Let's imagine somebody buying a book. What are the steps that they would go through in order to buy the book? Well, first they go to the store. Then they're going to search for a book called Continuous Delivery in our example. They're going to put the book into the shopping cart. They're going to go to the checkout. They're going to pay for the book with their credit card. And now they own the book. That's it. That's the specification. That's the story. So that's my test case. That's, that's what I'm going to create. So here's an example of the executable specification. We're going to search for a book called Continuous Delivery. We're going to select a book uh, from the, 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 the search for list because there'll probably be more than one book with Continuous Delivery in the title. So we're going to look for one with the name of the author. Then we're going to add the selected book to the shopping basket. Check out, go to the checkout and check out the, uh, with that book and assert at the end that the item has been purchased. I'd like to point out that even though what I'm showing here is written in Java, 
It's being organized in a way that says nothing at all about how the system works. This is not a technical test. This is wholly focused on what the system does and says nothing at all on how, of, about how the system should work. This is almost exactly the same language that I used when I was outlining the steps in my example, but lightly rearranged so that it can be computable. Now, I, my preference in implementing these sorts of tests is to use a thing called an internal DSL. That's a DSL hosted in a regular programming language, and then I get to use all of the tools of my programming language. So in this example, Java. But that doesn't stop you using the same techniques with an external DSL. That's where you have an explicitly different language, something like the Gherkin language within Cucumber or Specflow. Uh, is a good example of that. You can apply the, all of the ideas that I'm describing here uh, in those other uh, approaches, but my examples are going to be based on an internal DSL. The example says nothing about how the system works. So if our test cases look like this, how can we make the rest of them work if they're so abstract? The next layer down is the DSL itself, the implementation of the domain-specific specific language that is designed to make it easy to encode and capture our test cases. It provides access to a collection of behaviours that we're going to require of those test cases and is shared between them, so we get good reuse. If we are going to go to the store in one uh, user story, one acceptance test, one executable specification, and we're going to do the same thing in another one, we'll call on the same method in the DSL that goes to the store. So we can invest the effort to make sure that the work that it takes to go actually go to the store is repeatable and deterministic and works effectively. Here's a simple example of the next layer down. This is a checkout example. And in this example, we're putting some optional, param optimal, optional parameters in place. Uh, and we're parsing the inputs so that we can decide uh, the value of various things. And then we're calling down to the, to, to the next layer at the end. The, D the DSL provides default values creates aliases for, uh, for, for names in the system so that we can run the test repeatedly and have different real names in the system, but the test has a, a handle, a variable that it can use to interact with it. It, it allows us to, uh, generally, it's aimed at making it easy to write test cases. That's really what we're trying to achieve with the DSL. The DSL then calls into the next layer down. The third layer in my four layer architecture is what I call the protocol driver layer. Please note that at the point at which we call down into that layer, we're still using the language of the problem domain. We are still talking in terms of checkout. So the interface to the protocol driver is still high level and abstract. The job of the protocol driver, though, is to start translating these ideas into real interactions with the system under test. We're going to take the language of the problem domain and turn that into real interactions. Uh, if you want to test through the UI, you, maybe you'll use something like Selenium in this layer to go and drive the, a web-based UI. If your application exposes a, an API as part of its usual interface, then maybe you will be translating into calls into that API. If your application responds to messages, maybe you'll be generating messages. Whatever the natural interface to your system is, that's going to be the output. Uh, from the protocol driver layer. They, those are going to be the real interactions with your system. Think for a minute what that means. It means that the only part of our test infrastructure that understands the detail of how your system works is in the protocol driver layer. That is hidden completely from the test cases. In the test cases, you don't say things like search for this box or click on this button you say, buy a book, put the book in the shopping cart. The protocol driver understands what it needs to do. 
At the bottom of the stack, of my four layer stack, is the system under test itself. And of course, that's going to be deployed in a production-like test environment. We're going to evaluate that in these lifelike scenarios through these executable specifications and test cases. The four layer approach is exceedingly powerful. It's exceedingly capable. And it gives us such a high level of abstraction that we can do some quite interesting and sophisticated things with it. Think for a moment about my test case. Consider the example that I've, we've just worked through. Here it is again. Now read that. What does this have to say about Amazon? It has nothing to say about Amazon. This test case would be equally true of any other bookstore. This would even be true of a real world bookstore. In the Amazon example, the protocol drivers are going to do stuff like this. They're going to interact with the web page. They're going to use, in this case, loose selenium to find the right field to enter data in and so on in order to be able to bridge the gap between the DSL and the functioning of the system that we're trying to test. The protocol drivers, though, are the only part of the test and the test infrastructure that know anything about how the system works. This separation of concerns is enormously useful. With this level of separation, we could equally well imagine the protocol driver driving a real robot around a real store without changing anything in the test case. Here's my example. We go to the store. We search for a book. We put the book in the shopping cart and we go to the checkout. We pay with our credit card and now we own the book. This separation of concerns is so powerful that it means that you can write the test cases once and then reuse them in different scenarios through different interfaces in different in different interactions. It means that you can encode complicated setup mechanisms in the, in the DSL to get your system under test into the right state for you to verify things. I've been applying this approach in often complicated systems for many years now, and I haven't yet found a, a, an environment where this wasn't a really great way of keeping those test cases focused on what the system needed to do rather than how it did it. To recap, the four layers are the test cases themselves in the language of the problem domain, only talking about what the system needs to do. The DSL, which allows us to put in uh, optional parameters to be very precise in, in, in our specification of a case or very vague if we're trying to move quickly. It's optimized to allow us to write the test cases quickly and efficiently. The protocol drivers that translate from that abstract language of the problem domain into the language of the system so that we can interact with the system and actually test it. And then at the bottom of the stack, the system under test itself uh, that we're evaluating. I tend to prefer internal DSLs like the examples shown here, but you can implement this with just as easily in, in a regular uh, BDD style DSL. Uh, Cucumber or Specflow work very nicely with this separation of concerns, but the key idea is to treat the DSL as a thing in its own right and to abstract that and share it and reuse it. Don't write, write your scenarios from scratch every single time or your feature steps every single time. Use the DSL uh, and, and it's, it's a much more effective way of being able to write these things very quickly and very efficiently. The code uh, and a bit more from my are, are available in GitHub. I'll put a link in the description below so that you can take a look at it. It's not complete. I'm not really trying to test Amazon, but it demonstrates the ideas and it demonstrates the separation of concerns. If you'd like a copy of my free guide to acceptance testing, check out the details below. Thank you very much for watching.